Thank you so much that we get to come together tonight and praise you and worship you and thank you and that we get to hear your word preached. Lord, it is such a privilege to live somewhere that we can do this. And God, I pray that as we continue in this time of worship, that our eyes would be set exclusively on you. Lord, show us more of who you are through your word. And God, we just thank you for all you've done. I pray that you would remind us of what you've done. We love you and it's in your name we pray.
any working power on this earth for your glory is not through us alone, but through Christ in us. Lord, as we continue this service of worship by hearing your word, we just ask that the Holy Spirit would convict our hearts of truth, of sin, and that your word would encourage us and push us forward to act in obedience and act in bold faith. Francis Flaherty, Alfred Neitzel, and Artie Kopas. What do these names have in common? What's the common tie between them? Each one of those men received the Congressional Medal of Honor, the nation's highest medal of military valor. See, to earn this award, a a soldier has to display remarkable valor in battle, remarkable courage, sacrifice, bravery, daring, integrity, and love and sacrifice for his fellow soldiers. Francis Flaherty earned this medal at Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. As the Japanese fighter pilots swooped into the harbor and began bombing the planes, Flaherty's ship The USS Oklahoma was hit. The ship began to capsize. They gave the order, everyone clear the deck, get off the ship. Rather than dive into the water and save himself, Flaherty stayed. He stayed and armed with a flashlight, he helped crews escape from the darkness of the bowels of the ship. The crew escaped. Flaherty did not. Alfred Neitzel earned his Medal of Honor in 1944 the battlefield of Heistern, Germany. See, Netzel's troops, his soldiers were overrun by an enemy unit. And in order to cover his men as they retreated, Netzel stayed. And he grabbed his machine gun and he fired every round that he has, holding the enemy at bay so that his men could escape. After his his weapon clicked empty, They launched a grenade and blew him up. But his men survived. That's Alfred Neitzel. Artie Kopas earned his medal in Cambodia. May 1970. While on patrol, Kopas and his team were ambushed by an enemy unit, far bigger and stronger. Under intense fire, many of his men wounded. Copus jumped into the troop carrier, the vehicle in which they were in. The, the, the troop carrier was in flames, but it had a machine gun on top. He knew it was their only hope. So while his men escaped, while they dragged the wounded into safety, Copus launched himself onto this machine gun and began firing, keeping the enemy at bay. He fought until all of his men were escaped, till all of the wounded were pulled to safety. He didn't survive. Three men, three different stories, yet one remarkable display of selfless and sacrificial love in each instance. It's for good reason that these men earned the Medal of Honor. It's for good reason that their names will forever be inscribed in American military history. Because what they did that day, those days, on the battlefield, was unparalleled. They made their lives count. They made their lives matter in the way that they laid their lives down for others. That's why we know their names today. Did you know that standard of sacrificial love is exactly what Jesus Christ calls every believer to today? That kind of courageous, other-centered love is what Jesus expects for every single believer in this room. Not just the heroes, not just the strong ones, every one of you. And if you want to be a Medal of Honor kind of Christian, if you want to make your life count, if you want to make your life matter, 
And not in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of the God who made the world. If you want to make your life count, then it is that kind of sacrificial love that Jesus calls you to. Not just on the battlefield, but in the classroom, in the office, in the home, on the street, and everywhere in between. So turn with me to Mark chapter 12. We're going back to the same story we were in last week. Mark 12, 28 to 34. And in this passage, we'll discover the second critical Christian conviction that every one of you must own and embrace. Every one of you has to say, I will commit to this conviction. And that conviction is to be a Medal of Honor kind of Christian who demonstrates and displays this sort of remarkable, selfless, sacrificial love for the benefit of others. In short, you're called to love your neighbor. That's the conviction that I want you to understand and grab hold of tonight. Let's dive back into the story. Let me read it for us. Verse 28. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing. And recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and there is no one else besides him, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. Remember in our story, Jesus is in a confrontation with the Pharisees, the religious leaders. For three years, he's been a thorn in their side. He's been a plague and a bother to them. They're tired of him. They want to destroy him. So they've got another question to trap him, another question designed to catch him in something that they can then use to discredit him, to bring him before the Roman authorities, perhaps, and get rid of him. Here was their chance to capture Jesus in a trap. Notice the question. You remember it probably from last week. Which command is foremost of all? In other words, what matters most to God? What is most significant in the eyes of God? Well, you remember Jesus responds by quoting Moses. He quotes their hero, Moses. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. If your Bible has all caps, that's why, because Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy. And this is the Shema, this quote in all caps, the Lord, the Lord is one And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the Shema, right? The most famous prayer in Israel. The prayer that every religious Jew recited twice a day, morning and evening. It was posted above every household, the entrance. It was above every room in the house. This was the prayer of Judaism. If you were a faithful Jew, you prayed this prayer devoutly, devotedly. Verse 29 Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. The idea of that is we have a unique God. He's one and only. He's exclusive. He's not like the other gods of the nations. He's distinct. And so if you're going to love God as God requires, you must know the right God. You can't love God if you don't know God. You can't love what you don't know. And so verse 29, the first part of the Shema is, this is your God, Israel. And then verse 30. He talks about how you are to love your God. And this was our first great conviction, is you must love your God. See, loving God is what matters most, because God is what matters most. He doesn't need your worship. He deserves your worship. 
And so loving God is what is most central to the mind of God because he is worthy of your love. And this is an all-out, all-in kind of love. All that you are for all of your life. This is a love that requires everything about you. As you give the highest and the noblest and the best love to the highest and the noblest and the best God. That's verse 30. The greatest command is to love the greatest God. You want a life that matters? You want a life that counts? You got to do that. You got to love the God you know. And you have to know the God who revealed himself in the word. That brings us to verse 31. We're going to call this the commandment declared. If you're taking notes, three points. Point number one, the commandment declared. Verse 31, Jesus continues in answer to the foremost commandment. He said the second is this. The second most important is you shall love the Lord, or rather you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. See, Jesus does what no rabbi ever did. Jesus com combines loving God with loving your neighbor. And he says, this is the summary of the law. If you want to catch what is most significant, it's love God and love your neighbor. And again, you notice perhaps in your Bible, it's in all caps. That's because Jesus is again going back to Moses. He's going back to the Old Testament. And what we have here is a quote from Leviticus 19.18. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. Jesus is quoting Moses, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now you may ask of all the commandments that Jesus had at his disposal, why pick this one? Okay, I get why you should love God as the first and the foremost, but why love your neighbor? Why is that one the one that Jesus picked? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, because love for God is manifested, it's displayed, it's demonstrated in your love for others. Love for God is most evident when you love other people. Let me tie that to a text for you. 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. See, if you can't love a Christian brother that you know, you can't love a God you don't see. So that's reason number one. Love is a necessary validation and confirmation that you love God. When you love your Christian brothers and sisters, you send a clear signal that you love your God. And let me just say this, if you're not loving God, you don't have a hope of, of loving your neighbor. Love for God is the soil out of which the fruit of loving your neighbor grows. Reason number two, why did Jesus pick this command, love your neighbor? Because love fulfills the law. Notice how he said there is no commandment greater than these. Romans 13.8, why don't you turn there, Romans 13.8. Paul picks up on this theme. In Romans 13, 8, Paul says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Listen to verse 9. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Look at the last part of verse 10. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Same thing in Galatians 5, Galatians 5.14, it says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. One more, James 2.8. James says, if however you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Now the idea of a royal law means it's the supreme law, the sovereign law, the law, the law that binds everyone. And James says that law, that supreme law, is to love your neighbor. So that's why Jesus says, love your God, love your neighbor, number one and number two. If you want to have a life that matters, do this. 
So that's the commandment declared by Jesus. Now we'll look at the commandment defined. Because I want to I wanna expand on this. I want to elaborate on what does it mean to love your neighbor? I mean, if you've noticed, verse 31 is pretty short. Just, Jesus doesn't give a lot of commentary on it. So let's look at this through the lens of Galatians chapter 5. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to spend the remainder of our time in Galatians 5, verses 13 and 14, because Galatians 5 gives us a window into what God means by love your neighbor. These verses explain and expound upon the meaning of love your neighbor. So let me go ahead and read them for you. Starting in Galatians 5, verse 13. For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Focus in on verse 13. And just big picture context here. This is Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia. This is a church that had... Paul had come, he had started the church, he had preached the gospel to them, they knew the truth, and then when Paul was gone, false teachers crept in. False teachers began to say, listen, if you want to be saved, you've got to add on, layer on the law of Moses, because you can't please God unless you're obeying Old Testament commands. And so the Galatians began to be confused. They began to say, okay, well, I guess there are some other necessary compliments to the gospel in order to be saved. And so you could call them gospel confused. Paul writes this letter to correct and to clarify what is the gospel and to warn them against a dangerous heresy. So verse 13, he says, you were called to freedom, brethren. This is a freedom from, freedom from law, freedom from the bondage of the law because the Galatians were trying to go back and say, okay, now we need to keep Mosaic law. We've got to do everything that, that Moses commanded. And if you didn't know, that's a lot of laws, right? The Pharisees had divided that up into 613, 245 that you, or 248 positive commands that you should do this, and 365 ne negative commands, don't do this. So the Galatians are trying to do all of this, and so they're crushed by the burden of the law. And Paul says, no, you are called to freedom, brethren, Freedom from the tyranny of the law, from the burden of the law. Freedom from the power and the curse of the law. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Paul says, you were called to freedom. Not a freedom to sin, but a freedom from sin. Freedom to live in the liberty as a Christian. Notice what he says, but, or rather, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Because you see, there was this temptation for them to use their liberty, their freedom as a Christian, to not have to please God through law. They might say, well, if I don't have to obey the law, I can do whatever I want. I've got liberty, license to sin to the maximum because I'm free. So Paul says, no, 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 no. Don't turn it into an opportunity for the flesh. Opportunity is a word for like a military base from which soldiers would launch attacks. Don't let your freedom be something that is an excuse for you to launch sinful excursions, to delve into sin. Freedom in Christ is never an excuse to sin. And in fact, sin is always enslaving. See, sin is at odds with their freedom because if you as a believer say, I can do what I want, I can live however I want, doesn't matter what I do to my neighbor, doesn't matter what kind of love I have or don't have, because I'm saved in Jesus, I got a get out of jail free card, I'm going to heaven, I'm good. What you don't know is, one, you're probably not saved if you live that way, but two, you are enslaving yourself because sin is slavery. John 8, 34, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. So you don't want to live in sin, Paul is saying. Don't be deceived. Sin is the opposite of freedom because sin is slavery. So instead, there's a better way. That's why verse 13 says, don't turn it into an opportunity for the flesh, but. But and but signals there's a better way. It's not slavery to sin. 
It's something else. But what? But through love, serve one another. See, you want to know what real freedom is? You know what freedom as a believer is? It's through love to serve one another. Through means it's the channel. The channel for your freedom is love through service. Loving service, you could say. Same kind of love, that word love, same word for love as Jesus used. It's the noblest love, the highest love, the most sacrificial love. It's selfless and supreme. It's devoted and diligent. This is eager and expectant. This is the highest kind of love anywhere. And Jesus is saying the same kind of love that you love God with, that's the same manner of love which you are to display to people. And he says you are to, through love, serve one another. And that word serve is very interesting because it's not the serving that, say, you do in a nine-to-five job, right? Maybe you work at a restaurant, you clock in, you clock out, you do your time, you're off nights and weekends or whatever, but you're just there for your little period of time. You serve the guests, you help them out, but when your time is over, you're done. That's not the kind of serving that this is talking about. That, word, that verb serve, it's a command, and it means all the time. This is an all day, every day, beginning, end. This is an all in kind of service. It's always enforced, it's always expected. It's like a mother. Who has the hardest job in the world? Moms. Because the clock never stops for them, because they never get time off. Baby wakes up at two in the morning. I guess who's got to take care of that? Problem in the afternoon? Ooh, somebody had a good idea. <laughs> Usually mom. Sometimes if dad's good, if dad's a servant. But your mom's never off, especially when she's got kids. There's always meals to make, always things to clean, discipline to take care of. Mom is always on duty. Doesn't get a break. That's the flavor of serve here. And that's a command. That's not a suggestion. Paul isn't suggesting that it'd be good for you if you serve. He says, serve. This is God Almighty telling you, serve. All day, every day. You don't get nights and weekends off. You don't get paid time off. You don't get holidays. This is always the expectation. Loving service at all points. But it goes way deeper than that. That word serve means to be a slave. It's not a waiter kind of service. This means be a slave, literally in the Greek, be a slave. Put yourself under as a slave. Adopt the mindset of a slave to a master. And I get that in our culture, like, that's not okay talk. Like, this is politically incorrect. We shouldn't be using these kinds of words. But just, oh, by the way, that's what God informed and told Paul to write. Slave, serve, to be a slave to others. Now you should know a little bit about slavery in the Roman Empire because slaves didn't have it that well in the Roman Empire. There were lots of slaves and slaves had no rights, no legal rights. If your master was cruel or mean, you couldn't take him to court. Slaves had less rights than ex-cons. So it would be better for you in Roman Empire to murder somebody, do your time in prison and come out than to be a slave because at least as an ex-con, you've got rights. You've got no rights as a slave. You are treated as property. Your life is devoted to serving your master, period. That's what you exist to do. You didn't have a will of your own. You couldn't decide not to help the master. You couldn't say, no, I think I want to take a break. I'm going to sit this one out. You were subject to an alien will, that is a will outside of yours, an external will. That is all that is packaged into that word through love, serve. He's saying adopt the attitude and the posture of a slave. The lowest of the low in Roman society, the bottom of the barrel, the dregs of society, nobody wants to be a slave. And yet what God says through the pen of Paul is rather than live 
in liberty to sin as much as you want. You need to be enslaved, as it were, to enslave yourself through love to others. So you were saved to be a slave. Saved to serve as a slave. But don't think this is begrudging service, right? Like griping and grumbling, complaining, irritated and annoyed. This is not that kind of service. Now, some of us feel that way when we serve, right? We don't want to serve. And maybe even when we hear this, we say, I don't want to do that. I'm not buying into that slavery business. Nobody's going to own me, be my master. I'm my master. Is that rising up in anybody's heart? That kind of... Mm -mm, that's too much for me. I didn't buy into that. I'm fine being at church, but be a slave to other people? No way. Through love, serve one another. You know the model for that kind of service is? It's Jesus. Philippians 2. Listen to this description of Christ. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And you need to know that word means slave. Taking the form of a slave and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You want to know what loving service for one another looks like? Loving slavery to one another? It looks like Philippians 2, 5, and 8. It looks like Jesus Christ. Let me just draw out a few features from that text. He, he didn't regard equality with God. What is that but service rooted in humility? Dominating, pervasive humility. And he emptied himself. Notice that's reflexive, right? He emptied himself. Somebody didn't empty him out like a salt shaker. He did it. That's voluntary. That's willing. And he became obedient by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's submissive. That's willingly submissive. See, Christ gave you the ultimate level, or rather the ultimate example and picture and portrait of perfect loving slavery for others. How much more so should we? This is God in flesh becoming a slave to do that for sinners, that he might buy them out of sin. How much more should we, those sinners that his slavery to the point of death on a cross purchased our freedom, how much more should we be willing to serve? We should be willing to do anything that the master says after he's done everything for us. And oh, by the way, the verses for us that tell us how we're supposed to be this loving slave, go to, go to three and four, Philippians two, three and four. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others as well. And then in verse five, it says, look to Jesus, because he did it perfectly. The greatest became the lowest. Does that define your life? As a believer, is this true of you? Are you the kind of person that somebody would look at and say, man, all they're doing is they're such a servant. They're, they're, they're slaving away for the good, the benefit of others. Always looking to serve. Always cheerfully, happily, willingly, sacrificially serving other people. Is that the testimony of your life? Because the pattern from Christ is that that is to be us. Now, if, if you're struggling and you say, man, that's a bar too high. I can't reach that. I struggle to serve. I struggle to love. I struggle to want to help other people. I understand. 
because we have a common enemy. Look back, Galatians 5, the latter part of verse 13. There is an enemy inside all of us, a monstrous beast, a raging dragon. And it, rise, it, it, it lifts up its head every time that we're called to serve and love someone else at the expense of ourselves. And you know what it's called? It's called the flesh. You see, your flesh, he doesn't mean your skin. What he's saying is, that's that sinfulness that clings to you as a Christian. That remaining sinfulness that, that even though Christ has saved you and even though he's transformed you, there's still that tendency inside to sin, to do what you know that you shouldn't do. I think Costi calls it the crummy mummy. It's that grumpy old man of sin that still lives within that makes you do sinful things that you don't want to do. It's what Paul says in, in Romans 7, 21 to 23. He says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. But I see a different law in the members of my body making war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. There is a principle that evil is present in me. That's what Paul says. Paul, the greatest Christian ever. He says, I, I see that in me. There's a beast, an enemy, a monster lurking in my heart. And when we hear this text that we're supposed to willingly put ourselves beneath someone else as a slave to serve and meet their needs, mm, we don't like that. I don't like that. And it's because there's a beast called the flesh that rages in our hearts. I don't know if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings. I think it's the last one. We've got that dragon smog. Remember the dragon smog? He's big, he's nasty, he's got teeth and fire, and he's laying on his massive treasure. And if anybody comes and intrudes into his little lair, then the wrath of smog is aroused. Teeth out, fangs out, fire blazing. That's smog. Every one of you has a smog inside your breast, right here. You've got a smog. You've got a dragon of self. You've got a dragon of pride, a dragon of selfishness that reigns. And that dragon seeks to protect the kingdom of you. That sanctuary of self. There's the kingdom of me and the dragon of smog is always ready to, to protect you. So when you hear a text like this, mm, our flesh resists. There's friction because it is hard to accept that when the flesh is still alive. I can't, uh, there are so many times when I have had an opportunity to serve, to be generous, to be compassionate, to be selfless, and, and I, I hold back because I don't want to love that person as much as I love me. Because I love me most of all. I love me more than, than anybody and I want to care for me and take, watch out for me and man, I can't love you because loving you gets in the way of loving me and that's the beast of smog inside and that's what we have, this flesh that rages, breathes fire and that's the beast that has to be slain. That's the beast that we're supposed to resist and says, no, 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 Paul says, but through love serve one another. We have to slay that dragon through sacrificial, selfless love for other people. And at the very end, I'm gonna give you some real practical ways to do that. But there's a little bit more I wanna show you. That sacrificial, selfless love for others. Notice what it said. Through love, serve one another. I mean, that love has got to be flowing out of us. One another means... It's reciprocal, it's mutual, it's me to you, you to me, me to you, you to me. This is among believers, right? So this room here ought to be the most loving place any non-Christian has ever seen in his life. Because this kind of love, sacrificial, self-induced slavery to meet your needs, that ought to be taking place in every conversation, every day. And we're supposed to love one another Look at the end of verse 14. As yourself. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. And as yourself is really emphatic. It, it means as you yourself. Because we all love ourselves, don't we? Pretty naturally, right? But when you're sick, what do you do? Maybe you take an ibuprofen, you take medicine, you go to the doctor. When you're tired, what do you do? Take a nap, you go to bed. When you're hungry, what do you do? You get a snack, you, you eat something. You instinctively, reflexively, quickly meet your own needs, right? Because that's just inherent in us. And so what he's saying is that same degree of instinctive, reflexive, natural attention, devotion that you give to yourself to make sure your needs are met, Paul is saying, and Jesus is saying in Mark 12, that's the kind of love that you're supposed to display towards others. One commentator said, the idea is not that we should love ourselves, but that our self-love is natural and instinctive, and we should show that same level of care for others. Nobody has to motivate you to care for yourself, to take care of yourself, comb your hair, put on clothes that look good, maybe spritz some cologne on, make sure you don't have food in your teeth. Like, you do that naturally because you care about you. And what Paul is saying is that needs to be, that love that you have for you ought to be mirrored towards everyone outside of you. And so that's actually where we're going next because we've got to figure out who all am I supposed to love that way? If I'm supposed to be a slave, who am I enslaved to? Verse 14, love your neighbor as yourself. Exact same word that Jesus uses in Mark 12. Love your neighbor as yourself. Same word. They're talking about the same thing. And what a neighbor is, is it's not necessarily the guy that lives next door. It's not necessarily the family on your left or right or across the street. What a neighbor is, in biblical terms, in New Testament terms, what a neighbor is, is it's anybody who crosses your path. It's the Mormon missionary who comes and knocks on your door. It's that maybe overbearing coworker that you don't like to be around, who bothers you all the time and it's hard to get work done. It's that annoying younger brother or sister that always wants to be in your shadow and follow you and won't leave you alone and wants to be friends with your friends, but you don't want that. It's mom and dad who ask you questions and you just, you just want to go do your own thing in your room and like zone out and get on your phone and they want to talk. How was your day? Every one of those is your neighbor. Your neighbor is literally anybody who gets close to you because that word is actually a word that means it's not even a noun. It's just, it means whatever is near. Your neighbor is whoever is near. So yes, it includes believers, right? Galatians 6.10 says, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So should you love and be a voluntary slave to the people in, in your life who are Christians? Absolutely. How about Unbelievers. Does God expect you to love them in that kind of sacrificial, selfless way? Well, if Galatians 6.10 is right, then yes. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. How about people you don't like? How about people that bother you, that annoy you? What does God expect about that? Maybe better yet, how about people that are your enemy, that you don't like and they don't like you either? People that you don't even want to be in the same room as. They just bug you. You can't stand them. You gotta love them. You gotta serve them. You gotta be a slave to their needs. Matthew 5.43 says, yes. You have heard that it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You wanna have a life that matters, a life that counts? Then Christ says you've gotta display a selfless, sacrificial, slave-like love, voluntary, willing love to every single person who crosses your path, the people you like and the people you don't like, people that annoy you and the people that delight you. So let's look at this last point quickly. We're gonna call it the commandment displayed. Commandment displayed. This is the practical element. What do you do with this? 
Yeah, we've, we're supposed to live as slaves to others to meet their needs, to care for them more than ourselves. That same kind of reflexive, natural, instinctive love that we have for us, we're supposed to bounce that to them. But how do you do that? Well, first, you can't do it if you're not saved. See, it's impossible. You can't love others because you love yourself too much and people just get in your way. So you've got to be a Christian. And even if you are a believer... It doesn't come automatic, right? That's where he says in Galatians 5, 6, 5, 16, just two verses later, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So you've got to have the Holy Spirit's help to do this. You've got to walk in the spirit, be empowered by the spirit, be in line with the spirit, be in step with the spirit. If you have any prayer of living a life that matters by loving your neighbor. But the good news is the spirit is here to empower and enable us. So let me very quickly walk you through how you can do this, how you can love your neighbor in practical, real ways. And I'm going to do it by going to the law, right? Paul says love is the fulfillment of the law. So let's go to the law. Let's go to Exodus 20. We're going to look very quickly at the law, the Ten Commandments as a summary of the law. And let me show you how you can love your neighbor in a selfless, sacrificial, as a slave, willing, voluntary way. First four commandments, verses one to 11, it talks about how to love God. You love God, you'll keep commandments one to four. It's commandments five through 10 that are all encompassed under that thought of love your neighbor. Fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. In other words, love your parents. Love your parents. How do you do that? How do you practically love your parents in this kind of way? Don't talk back to them. Don't give them attitude. Don't roll your eyes. When they're talking to you, don't turn your back and walk away. Don't slam your door. When they're talking, listen. They say something you don't like, listen. They ask you questions, respond with more than grunts. If you're a guy, girls, you probably don't have that problem. That's how you love your parents, is you honor them and obey them. You don't test their authority. You don't talk bad about them behind their back. Sixth commandment, don't murder. Okay, how do I love my neighbor this? Well, don't murder. In other words, value your neighbor's life. Cherish his physical well-being. Love your neighbor by not being a bully, by not using physical intimidation. Maybe you're big and strong. Maybe you're a big athlete, and maybe you can throw your weight around. You can make people cower before you because you're a big shot. Love your neighbor by not physically intimidating by not being a jerk. Love your neighbor by not attacking their character. You may never, you know, try to murder someone. Oh, but you'll do it with your words. You pull them out like knives and just go to town. Love your neighbor by not condemning them, criticizing them, gossiping about them, slandering them. Don't do it on social media. Don't hide behind the anonymity of the internet to assassinate someone else's character. Seventh commandment, don't commit adultery. In other words, love your neighbor so much that you won't violate their purity. Is this one relevant to you? Love your neighbor, love your boyfriend and girlfriend so much that you won't pressure them to do physical things with you that you know they shouldn't. Don't ask them to do things that you know God hates because you don't have the relationship for it. You're not her spouse. You're not his spouse. Don't pressure your boyfriend or girlfriend or any other person to do things physically that God prohibits. And if you're the one being pressured, refuse and get out of there because that person is bad news. They don't love you. They want to use you. And if you're the one doing that, boy, you got some repentance ahead of you. Love your neighbor by valuing their soul above their, above your physical pleasure. Love your neighbor by not looking at pornography, by not fueling an industry that devalues women and leads men into slavery and destruction. You want to love your neighbor? Love their purity and reject all that the world throws at you regarding sexual morality. Number eight, eighth commandment, don't steal. Love your neighbor by respecting their property. Don't damage their property. Don't vandalize things. Don't destroy things that aren't yours because it's funny. 
Don't take what isn't yours. If God hasn't given it to you, it's because you don't need it. So don't take someone else's. Ninth commandment, don't lie. In other words, love by speaking the truth. Refuse to deceive. Refuse to bend the truth. Refuse to give a half truth. That's how you love. You can love your neighbor by having a hard conversation. If you see them in a pattern of sin and you need to go to them, you need to tell them the truth. You need to love your neighbor more than yourself by going and warning them that you see a destructive pattern in their heart, in their life. Number 10, 10th commandment, don't covet. In other words, love your neighbor by being content with what you have. Love by not trying to undermine a coworker so you can get the promotion. Love by trying not to make that other guy in your team, other girl on your team look bad so that your coach make, puts you in that varsity spot, puts you in that starting position. Don't be so greedy for what they have that you're willing to sabotage them so you get a step in advance, so you get that next position. That's how you live a life of sacrificial love. That's how you live a life that matters. You want to love your neighbor? You want to have a life that counts in the eyes of God? Then you've got to own that conviction. You've got to embrace it. You've got to say, I'm willing to go all in on this. I'll commit my time, my energies, and my effort to this. We saw what men like Francis Flaherty did. Alfred Nietzsche. Andres Copas. We saw what they did on a battlefield, that selflessness that they displayed for the good of their men. Christ is calling you. He's calling you to display that kind of selfless love, sacrificial, I'm a slave to you, willingly, voluntarily kind of love. Most of you won't win a Medal of Honor, but in the end, the Medal of Honor goes away. You want to be a Medal of Honor kind of Christian who gets a medal that lasts into eternity? You do this. You love your neighbor in that kind of sacrificial way. And then when you die, better than a medal, you get that commendation. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, teach us to love like this. There is so much resistance in our hearts to this kind of humble, ultimate love, a love that prefers the other person. So I do pray by the power of the Spirit you would do what our flesh resists, that you would help us to love our neighbor in that kind of all-out sacrificial way. Do it so that we would make Christ look good, so that his church would be pure, his bride would be lovely, and his name would be honored. Amen.
Uh, first question we got in is, what is a way to become stronger in my prayer game? That's verbatim. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> uh, the best way is to pray every day. Make sure that you have an established time. I mean, the scripture talks about pray at all times, pray with all kinds of prayers. And so if you want to have a prayer life of power or that, that really drives you forward spiritually, I think it's important to set aside time every day. I mean, if you don't pray at all, start with five minutes a day. Um, you can always build. Don't set your sights too high, right? If you don't pray, you're probably not going to pray for an hour tomorrow and then every day after. But you can build up incrementally. So making it a habit daily is the best thing. And um, once you kind of have a set time, like I pray in the morning right after I have my time in the Word, then I do my prayer time. And it's early enough so that nobody wants to talk to me at that hour of the day. So I don't have any distractions. Uh, for you, it may be morning. It may be afternoon in between classes. It could be right after you get out of work. Kind of depends on your life stage. But daily and consistent, that'll be a key for victory. All righty, next question. Um, when did you know God loves you? And when did you know he was leading you to serve him as a pastor? I got saved when I was seven, so I grew up in the church, and I believe the Bible. I have a great mom and dad who are strong Christians, and they took me to church every Sunday, honestly, from the first Sunday after birth. So uh, I was always in church, but a Christian, that does not make me. Uh, but I believed what I heard. I wanted to follow God. I, um, I just wasn't until I was seven, I would say, that I came to the point where God really brought me to a place of genuine repentance and say, like, I want to worship you. I want to surrender to you as Lord. Yeah, I know I deserve to go to hell. I sin all the time, um, but I know Jesus is Savior. So I would say I got saved at seven, turned from sin, placed my faith in Christ, and by God's grace, he never let me go stray from that. And uh, honestly, I didn't want to be a pastor until, like, recently. I really wanted to be a missionary. I thought I was going overseas. That's why I went to seminary in California, is to go be a missionary to China. But as God often does, he really redirected. And year three of my six in California, I began to be open to the idea of being a pastor in America. Before that, I would have said, like, no way. I won't even entertain the notion of staying in America. I'm just so focused on going overseas to do mission work and proclaim the gospel where they don't have it. But God did this sort of undercurrent kind of work in my heart at this point, like three-ish years ago. I began to be open to be a pastor, still pursued missions, but was more willing to stay if God directed me in that path. And then even up to the very morning that I accepted this position, I was still thinking, God, are you going to send me overseas because I have this option and I'm really willing to go overseas. And, um, but God made it clear that pastoring in the States is my next step, and I'm definitely happy to be here. Uh, when you go God's way, it's always better than whatever you could come up with. Awesome. Uh, next question we got is, if loving your neighbor as yourself is the second biggest commandment, why do we see lots of Christians being hateful to certain groups of people? Mm. Because not every Christian obeys God the way that they were, they were commanded to. I mean, if you think about it in a perfect way, I would never be selfish. I would never be unkind to you. I would never be irritable. I would never be short with you. I would always prefer you, but honestly, I don't. And so Christians are on this spectrum of sanctification, right, of being saved and then progressing towards holiness, and some don't make it all that far, right? Um, so it's sad and it's unbiblical to not love your neighbor, but we all do it. We all show that unlove in just varying de to varying degrees. All righty, next question. What is your favorite theological book and or books and uh, favorite theological authors? Hmm, should probably save this for Costi. But... Um, you know, theology, I'm just going to change the answer. I'll tell you one book, spiritually, spiritual book that I've majorly benefited from. It's called Spiritual Leadership by Oswald Sanders. It was, ooh, I don't even know when it was written, long time ago. 
well before the 2000s. Um, but it's about how to be a leader and how to be a godly leader. And what does the Bible say about godly leadership and qualities? And I think that's, it ought to be a necessary re- read for every Christian because you're all a leader in some way. And all of us need to be godlier in the way that we live. Uh, Oswald Sanders, yeah, he's a good one. Anything by, well, a number by Tozer, a bunch of books by Tozer would be good, R.C. Sproul. And that's A.W. Tozer, right? A.W. I don't know the other. I want to clarify. In case there's another Tozer out there. All right. And our next question, uh, is it wrong to date non-Christians if I am a believer? Oh, come on. That's a softball. I had to throw you some softballs, I mean. Uh, yeah, you're foolish to do so. Just to be blunt, you're foolish. Because um, you get your emotions involved, and then you stop thinking rationally, biblically, and you're thinking with emotions, and so you're willing to keep going deeper down that dark hole of future sin. I mean, the Bible's explicit. Yeah, you can't marry a non-believer, and if you can't marry one, why would you date one? What are you looking to do in dating Um, you know, that's some questionable motives there. So missionary dating is also a bad idea. So maybe, I think girls maybe would be more apt to say like, oh, I can change him. Like I'm good. He's a bad boy rebel, but I can change him. I'll bring him to church. Yeah, right. That, uh, that sinful heart's not going to be persuaded by your sweet smile. I promise you. Uh, so don't date a non-Christian, because if you couldn't marry them, what are you wasting your time dating them for? Evangelize them, love them, be gracious and kind, and love them as your neighbor, but don't date them. Yeah, no way. And I don't know that. If it's meant to be, like, evangelize to them, they'll know Christ, then it can happen. But before totally. then, it's yeah. not a not good idea. Yeah, before they need you, they need Christ, because you can't help them at all. But Jesus is all the help they need. And then if they're saved, yeah, fair game. Fair game. Alrighty, next question. Based on tonight's scripture, how would you address the self-love message that the culture is preaching to us? Good question. Yeah, they pervert that text all the time to say, I don't know if you, especially if you ever read anything in psychology or kind of popular self-help stuff or anything online, like love yourself, can't love others until you love yourself. Um, that's the exact opposite of what that text says. And you don't need anybody to tell you to love yourself because you just do that naturally, right? You breathe as, as naturally as you breathe in and out, you love yourself. And so, yeah, it's always in the mind of sinners to pervert God's word for their own purposes. So biblically, yeah, you're going to love yourself. That's not the issue. It's it's loving your neighbor that Christ is calling you to do. So that kind of garbage you just got to reject because it definitely flies in the face of, of biblical revelation. Mm-hmm. Next question we have is, how would someone know if God is telling them to pursue a career in ministry? Good question. So you're going to have two factors to pay attention to. There's going to be an internal compulsion and an external confirmation. Internal compulsion means you want to go to ministry. Um, 1 Timothy 3 talks about, hey, if you aspire to an elder, the office of an overseer, it's a noble thing. Um, One of those words has the idea of an internal propulsion towards it. You want it inside, like there's a God-given, I want to preach the Bible. I want to um, serve people in my church in a formal way. But that's not enough, right? Because you might say, hey, I'm oh, I want to be a pastor and, you know, I'm great with people and I, I can preach my socks off and the people in your Bible study just sleep through your sermons because you're no good. And uh, so if there's not the external confirmation, and that definitely needs to come by folks saying like, hey, like, we would encourage you to ministry, right? Yeah, you're faithful, you know the word, you've got a gift to preach. Uh, but especially spiritual leaders in your life, Hopefully you've got a disciple in your lo- disciple maker and a disciple, but you've got a disciple maker investing in you and that person should be able to say, like, for sure, I see that in your life. Your pastors at the church should be able to say, yeah, I see that kind of ministry bent in you. I see that God has equipped and prepared you for that. Totally encourage you to do that. But if they say, man, I don't think so, I think you'd be a better accountant than a better pastor, then, uh, yeah, you ought to pray more, take their advice, wait, and see what God does. But if they're saying no, and you're the only one saying yes, that's God's sign that probably you're not meant for it. All righty. Um, what would you say is the best way to overcome temptation? 
Ooh, Proverbs talks about that. Um, let me just read you the proverb. I mean, initially, go the other way. You got to pull a Joseph, right? Hey, Joseph, come with me. I'm part of his wife. I'm pretty. You're young. Let's go back there. And Joseph runs away. He doesn't try to stop and have a dialogue with her and explain why it wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, he just runs. And so it's not always bad to be a coward. In that case, it's the best form. Proverbs 4, 14, and 15 Mark this one down. This lays out your pathway for purity, purity over any temptation, not just immorality. Verse 14, do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not proceed in the way of evil men. So don't even take one step down that road because it will snowball. Verse 15, avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. In other words, if you see the temptation coming, you just flat out run. You go the other way. You get out of there. Um, If it's an image on a screen, you turn it off. You get out of the room. If it's somebody in the gym wearing what they shouldn't, um, man, you bounce. If it's, I don't know, temptation to steal, whatever it is, you just avoid it. You run away. You get out of there like the room's on fire, whether that's in your thought life or physically. Awesome. I think we'll end our Q&A on this question. <coughs> Jeremiah, as a new pastor, well, what does an average day look for, like for you when you're not preaching? I'm getting ready to preach. Uh, I was talking to Kosti today. I had lunch with him. And albeit I am a new pastor, right? So I don't know the game yet. I don't know how to structure everything. But I was saying, Kosti, it is, man, I feel the burden of preaching. And being a pastor is more than preaching. But if you preach, it's a lot of what you do. You preach and you care for souls. Um, But the preaching part, because I haven't met a ton of people yet, so now it's kind of more on getting my feet wet and getting acquainted with people and getting ready to preach. So I was saying, Kosti, it's hard. It's a burden. Like, I feel the weight of it. And it takes a lot of time. I mean, I was here till basically eight last night, still working on that sermon and put a bunch more hours in night today. Um, But preaching is weighty, and it requires so much time if you're going to tell people rightly what God says, because nobody cares what I say. Nobody should care what Costi says. You should only care what God says. So what we say only matters to the extent that we're imitating God's words. So my life thus far, oh, lots and lots of hours towards preaching and getting ready to preach and studying the passage and praying about it, trying to work it into my own heart. Awesome. Well, that's our Q&A for the day. Thank you so much for answering our questions and letting us get to know you a little bit better. Uh, Gathering, thank you for coming, and we'll see you again next week. Have a great day. Evening.